This episode of the Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 481 for Wednesday, June 5th, 2024. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into, and it's available on all of the major podcasting platforms. So if you're listening to this on one of those podcasting platforms, including YouTube, then why not leave us a like or a subscribe, whatever that free button is that says, I want to follow this and hear more. Joining me this week, Stephen ESC is back, as he often is. You can find him at Stephen ESC on all the social media that matters. And that is, of course, Stephen with a PH. Hello, sir. Of course. Hello. How are you? I am great. We have had a big week over at the Spun mm-hmm. Chunks, the other podcast that I do. We have launched our 300th episode this past Monday. And to celebrate, we did a three-hour super extended all-listener Q&A segment. Uh, we still covered Minecraft in the news at the top of the show, but the email section was quadrupled, essentially. Our normal show length in total is an hour and 15 minutes, and only about right. 20 minutes of that is normally email and listener response. This was three hours uh, with the render distance. I think it was like two hours and 47 minutes for the public version. So it was a long, long stint in the chair. It was fun. But I'm someone that normally takes a break once an hour when I stream. And so to sit and do a live podcast video recorded for three hours, like my butt was numb when I got up at the end of the (laughs) the show. It was a really fun conversation. Johnny and I had a blast. Uh, I am, I guess, happy with the video output. It's one of those things where just like anything else in podcasting, it's better to just start doing it and iterate and get better as you go. Uh, we had about four weeks of practice behind the scenes, and then we launched the video. I want to make some changes to my camera setup. I want to make some changes to my studio and put up some different stuff and change the lighting and whatnot. And uh, I think that will just be something that comes eventually. But we've had a lot of really good feedback on the YouTube channel, which is just youtube.com slash the spawn chunks. And we've had people saying how much they like it. Uh, obviously, it'll be a little bit more easy to digest as a hour long, hour and 15 long show instead of a three hour long show. Uh, but it was fun. People asked us all, everything from like, what's your favorite dessert? Who, what's your favorite kind of animal to <laughs> Minecraft questions, podcasting questions, uh, content creator questions. So it was kind of a mix. We tried to represent a, a, a variety of questions and we could not get to them all. There were so many. I, I think mm. I only really used I want to say 60 or 70% of the questions that we had, and it was still a three hour show. And some of those questions were doubled up. Like if two or three people wrote in and say like, well, how did you and Johnny meet? How did the spawn chunk start? We mentioned that email or that question from like three or four different people. So it, uh, there was a lot, a lot to cover, which was good. And, uh, discovered that Johnny nor I can give short answers to anything. Uh, we, (laughs) We tend to talk a lot, which is fine when you do this for a living, it's probably a good thing. Uh, but yeah. it did mean that the show ran a, a little bit on the long side. So uh, now you can watch Johnny and I every week on YouTube. We do include some graphics as well. So when Johnny and I are talking about our builds, when we are talking about different things that are in the news, we'll show the change log notes. We'll show screenshots of the things that we're working on and building. And so that is pretty cool. I also think that it helps with some of the fun things that happen on the show, uh, jokes that we make. Uh, reactions to questions or emails, uh, ideas that we have that might spark a reaction. I think it's a little bit more engaging to have that kind of stuff. And I'm going to tip my hat to Johnny. Uh, He did a great job editing the show. We put together a template uh, and it's a combination of like either the two of us up on screen in separate squares or a single shot of either Johnny or myself or a full screenshot for something like a um, screenshot that has like a Minecraft image or something in the background. So it was a fun time, and I would encourage anybody to check it out if you are so inclined to watch your podcasts. Uh, I know that I have been watching more podcasts lately, more often than Mm. not when I'm watching TV in the evening and I want something a little bit easy that I don't want to be worried about pausing, like something that doesn't have a narrative, like a plot or a pace. 
it's just an interview then I can kind of pause that and pick it up at any time. I also right. find it handy when I'm eating to watch podcasts because if you're looking down at your plate, you don't miss the cool thing that happens on screen in an action show or, you know, sci-fi or fantasy or whatever. So um, we are also working on putting the video out on Spotify. So if you are a Spotify listener and you prefer consuming video shows on Spotify, then we're looking into adding it on the back end. There's just a couple of different uh, requirements that Spotify has for the video format that I believe differ a little bit from what Johnny put on YouTube. So it might take some time for him to like re-export and figure that out, but it should be going forward a pretty simple kind of point and click and upload and it should be in both locations. So that's really what's new with me because that encompassed my entire weekend. I missed two streams. Uh, one of them was uh, an, an airport pickup and the other one was prepping for show heat 300. So like I, I just did not have time to do much this mm -hmm. weekend other than prep for that. So, but I'm, I'm happy to hit it. It's a fun milestone and here's to 300 more. Yeah, no kidding. Congratulations. That's uh, no small feat. Thank you. I, I appreciate it that it's uh, it's weird that the spot of the spawn chunks is catching up to the numbers on the Citadel Cafe quickly. I was I was going to comment on that. Like, soon it'll be you'll have maybe you can yeah, have like 550 in both of them in the same week. It'd be pretty, pretty funny if you could do that. It would be it would be interesting. I mean, we we work really hard on the spun chunks to not miss a week. We record extra yeah. over Christmas to publish every single Monday. So we release essentially 52 shows a year and it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And the Citadel Cafe lately uh, has been a little bit more sparse and that's just because mm -hmm. of availability of guests and my own availability to edit and publish. So um, I want to increase that, but uh, I think that one thing that's nice about the Citadel Cafe is that it's not news based. So like if we miss a couple weeks in Minecraft news, like we're behind and right. th this, this way, uh, on the Citadel Cafe, it's a lot more leisurely. And I, I hope that people can like listen to a show that's a month old here and still get something out of it. Like maybe they're just getting to the show. I mean, I feel like you and I have had this conversation where we feel overwhelmed by the stuff we either want to watch or feel like we should watch to not get spoiled. And then yeah. you end up being like, well, yeah, I've finally watched the show. It's, it's a month after it was first released, but I just couldn't get to it until now. My worry anyway, that I just can't be as timely with the things that I watch as I would like. I still want to talk about it because it's new to me and I find it interesting. But if the entire world has seen it already, it's just I've only had time to watch it now. So I don't necessarily have time to squeeze something else new in. So what's new with you? In typical Stephen fashion, as like my brain latches onto a thing and I just sort of started to run with it. And I'm not sure if you remember, but when we went to uh, Battery Park a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Citadel Cafe a bit, and I mentioned that I was going to create like a flow diagram for rating movies and TV shows. <laughs> right. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, I haven't gotten into it as deeply as I would like, but I've already started doing the research because I was sort of found it a bit difficult to figure out how I wanted to start it. And I figured probably somebody out there probably already done something similar to it. So if basically somebody with more film knowledge would have known or at least listed the things to look for in a film that I may not be as is uh i guess familiar with. like it's it's not my industry so i just do it for fun but other people who are who look at this and critique movies for a living they'd be able to kind of bang 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 list all of the things to consider um so i found one that was pretty good it was a uh, by mg jasper over on medium he provided a, a a good information like a list of 10 things to look for in a movie and each of those 10 things had basically broken down into two two subcategories so in, in each one worth a half a point so if it doesn't hit the mark it misses the half a point. You tally it all up and it's out of 10. So um, I don't know. I've been looking into a couple of other options, but I, I'm kind of calling this one out because it feels like I don't necessarily like this system of everything being worth half a point, but I like the list. Like it talks about plot, theme, acting, dialogue, and like a good, a good list of things that I just, I think about sometimes, but just weren't on my radar when I was putting this list together. So mm -hmm. having everything worth a half a point just doesn't feel right because you could have you know, half a point for story arc. You know, if, if the ending is just garbage and like if the entire movie is feels like a 10 out of 10 movie, but the end just tanks the entire thing. To me, that's not a nine and a, a nine and a half out of 10 movie. You've, that's like a three points or something like that should be taken off for a story that just can't finish properly. I agree. I think that assigning a different and probably subjective value to each of the different categories is is important because some people are not going to care as much about acting as they do about like visual effects and the overall ride versus mm -hmm. other people will be just like caring 
less about the the effects or the or the music or something and then really what they want to see is good acting or good storytelling and all that kind of stuff yeah i think it'll depend on the type of movie as well like true if if you're going into the theaters to see a big screen feature something like something that just won't won't feel the right way something about it just won't feel the right way seeing it on a smaller screen when you stream it at home like it's got to have that big the big screen experience then you're you're going to be going into that for different reasons than you would be i don't know a, a story based movie like about a relationship story i guess you could say so i don't know how to do this and i I'd, I'd, i wish i knew had the know how to take what i want to do and make a little like a website out of it or an app so you can just go to go through and go click 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 was the story arc good yeah but did the ending was the ending garbage yep so then you know you might get a point up for the being a good story but then two points down for being a bad ending so that who knows if i can do it but right now that's 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 the the fun little deep dive my brain's doing right now so you almost need a choose your own adventure chart like exactly did, did you like the writing yes no if yes proceed if no why or if no proceed to uh did the acting make up for bad writing yes no proceed mm. like i i feel like there could be some that's it's almost like that would be a fun jokey site in itself because of the things that you know you have to sacrifice you know if if you yeah are not impressed <laughs> by if you are not impressed by the writing what is it about the movie that redeemed itself and if the answer is no to like four or five you know major things like acting cinematography uh soundtrack and and plot were all crap then like the end should be congratulations you've wasted your time like <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's a crappy movie uh you watched you watched a solid b shit show <laughs> you know like that that could be <laughs> that could be some fun stuff i used to do very similar things to uh i want to say it was college humor was the client they were they were illustrative and they would be like video game related or video game meme related and right. they would be written for me and so I didn't have to come up with the flow chart. It was already kind of outlined for me in like box form. Uh, and then I would be adding all of the illustrations and the graphic design and uh, a little bit of the whimsy that would go with it. Uh, any kind of like onomatopoeia, like all that kind of stuff was really, was really fun to do. Um, I still have them up on, I think it's behance.net although that might have gone away now that i don't have an adobe subscription so i don't know right yeah um anyway they're around i do i do have them somewhere and uh they were a lot of fun because they were just flat cartoony illustrative graphics the budgets weren't huge but they also said like look like we also don't expect you to break your back on these so like mm. get them done they're meant to be more red and funny than funny to look at so it was more about just having them stand out on the website so it was a lot of fun and they're quick they're quick too usually right like if they just go along with Oh, so it's on their website. It wasn't like something that went along with a video piece. It was like a blog. It was like a, a website really thing. This was years ago before video gotcha. was absolute. Right. Video was still out there, but this was long before video was king. This would have been like a, a Facebook post that you would have seen shared around. Like it was meant to be right. a social media shareable thing, but it was meant to be engaged with on like a phone or a laptop or something. It wasn't meant to be scrolled through on a video like you mm. you would you'd want the control of the mouse to be in in the viewer's control because they would be going back up and down and left and right on the flow chart depending on how i had to arrange it. it they were fun challenges actually to to get them to look cool but also flow correctly and you had to do like you know arrows going over and under one another and like all the graphical stuff that that's fun to do uh in that way and it was all photoshop there was so many layers oh, it was wow. the, that was the only thing about them that was really tough is that there were so many layers but photoshop <laughs> is what i knew how to use quickly right so with the low budget 700 megabyte file yeah oh for sure because they would be screen resolution like you know 1920 but then they would be like you know eight screens tall like it would just be like a scroll right so yeah, yeah, yeah they were fun they're fun well this is cool i mean I, i'm assuming you're going to be attempting to implement this as we talk about more on the show in the future Exactly. Yeah. It's like the, the the plan is to have something so that when you and I go to talk about a show, I can say, well, you know, overall, I like this. I give it a, I don't know, you know, a little bit of, you know, two thumbs up, one thumbs down kind of thing. Or I just thought if I could go in and just be a little bit more objective with it, you know, still have a bit of subjectivity to it. But yeah, I think it'd be fun. And if I ever find the time, if I could somehow make a website out of it or, or powers that be forbid an app <laughs> yeah 
that'd be a fun little thing to do. Just even just like a challenge for myself to feel like, see if I can get it done. Yeah. And that's a cool side project too. Like, even if it's just something that you end up from a graphic design standpoint, working out like that's, that's a fun thing to, to work on too. Right. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I don't have it done yet. So I'll be, um, I'll be using the, using Jasper's cinema scale to rate the movie that I saw today. So. <laughs> Well, speaking of graphic design, we have an email this week from Lord Valor, a cafe barista patron in our community. The subject is freelancing tips. Hi, Joel and Stephen. I have recently entered the quote unquote working world upon graduating from university. Well, congrats, Lord Valor. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I have graduated with a degree in digital media production, a movie degree, as we call it. One of my options is to go into film freelancing for people's weddings, ceremonies and other events. Joel, as someone who does art freelance, what are some things I need to seriously consider and know if I were to go this route? Any things or any tips are helpful. On a different note, I recommend watching Percy Jackson and the Olympians on Disney+. Plus. The Percy Jackson series was my favorite book series, kind of still is, and I think it's about time we got a good re recreation of those books in cinema form. Thanks for the wonderful podcast and six plus years of entertainment you have provided for me thus far. Cheers, Lord Valor. P.S. Joel, I am still waiting for you to try Subnautica. <laughs> you might be waiting a while because my video game time is woefully, woefully low. And uh, I have other things on my list that I want to play and I just have not gotten to them because I, whenever I sit down to play, I'm usually working and playing Minecraft. So it's also something that might happen more in the wintertime. Now that it's summer, I'm spending a lot more time sitting outside reading, um, which is good for me, bad for video game completion checklists. So I guess just to kind of get it out of the way, uh, we can talk a little bit about Percy Jackson. I started watching it and fell off. I want to say that it wasn't that it was bad. I think it's just that's when I stopped subscribing to Disney+. Plus. I think that's when they upped the subscription fee uh, around yeah. January for me, December, January. And I was still in the middle of watching it, but then ultimately uh, gave it up because at the time there was no new properties that were of interest to me. So it was like the thing that I was the most interested in, not that I was interested in it per se, but it, like it was the most interesting of the things I have not seen. I thought the production quality was okay. The actor that was in it was good. I don't remember his name. Uh, it felt very Harry Potter, uh, you know, a kid that has parents or daddy issues, uh, is roped into a mystical world and has to prove himself amongst other kids that are learning how to be mystical in a mystical world. Like it was pretty straightforward. Um, mm. not to slam the books. Like I'm sure, I'm sure the books are probably a much better experience and they do a, a great deal to separate themselves. I'm sure from Harry Potter, because I've heard lots of people like the books, uh, especially a, of a certain age range. Um, the Disney plus show looked cool. Like it was well produced and, um, had really great music from what I remember. So, uh, folks, if you want to check it out, if you're into that kind of thing, fantasy shows, uh, then, then maybe go down that road. I, I didn't feel as a, someone that was watching that had not read the books that I was left in the dark. Like I didn't feel like there was a lot of Easter right. eggs or things that people in the book are going to get a lot more out of. It was pretty self-explanatory, but at the same time, that also felt like it was aimed at some younger younger viewers. I do remember spending the first couple of episodes trying to figure out the rules of the world, as you often do with like a fantasy show or a sci-fi show. You try to figure out like, well, what are the rules? Like do physics work? Like what's, is it magic? Is it power? Their deities? Like how does it all kind of work? And so I was trying to figure that out while I was watching and I ended up with a lot of questions, but I didn't watch long enough to probably have those questions answered. Right. Have you seen it at all? I have not, unfortunately, have very little I can contribute to it other than it It was on my list of things I wanted to check out before I get rid of Disney Plus as well. But um, same as you, when the price went up, I just thought, you know, I'm just I had subscribed for a year. So I think I had it a bit longer than you did. Right. Once the year ran out, I just yeah. went, no, I, I can't right now. And or I'm considering resubscribing depending on what, you know, what, what content is there. And just kind of it's it's tough, though, because if I subscribe only for a month or two, it's going to be after there's a bit of you know, a bit there that I want to watch. And then it's that balance between do I have enough time to get it all in in one month right. or two months yeah, so that it's not just, you know, me, me paying, having to start paying three to four months in a row now for a show that only should have taken me a month. So it's, I might just wait until a full show that I want to watch is there and then just maybe subscribe based on the idea of watching one whole show. So it's going to be like, well, 16 bucks gets me eight episodes. Cool. That's the thing. And I'm going to just do that for the month. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I would say, you know, put the value on something important that you wanted to watch. I'll, I'll use Kenobi just as an easy example. If you wanted to watch Kenobi, there's six episodes. You know that it can get done in a month. You know you have six hours in a month to get that in from a watch time perspective. Yeah. And then you just decide, is that worth the 14? Yes. Okay, great. If I watch anything else, then bonus. You know, then I'm just, I'm, I'm doing more than I set out to at that point. So I would agree. I think um, it's, it's a good thing for people to remember that you can unsubscribe to these things when there's nothing on, or if you're just outside more in the summertime, that's why I have not resubscribed to Netflix because uh, it's something that mm. I know I will usually find something to watch on it, but I've been trying to watch more stuff intentionally and I already always have prime video and Apple TV plus. So yeah. those are built in They're They're bundled with other services that I just never cancel. So I will always have those to watch. I, I do pay a little bit extra for Paramount, but that's because I'm sharing that on a family plan with parents. Uh, and there's a lot on there that they watch. So I wouldn't be getting rid of that either. But that, that also gives a little bit more for me. There's some movies that come out on Paramount that, I, you know, you wouldn't get on other streaming services. So uh, we'll have to see because Skydance just bought or will be buying Paramount in the near future. Okay. So uh, we'll see how that goes and what content comes to Paramount under that. So that would be cool. Moving on to the uh, bigger part of the email, uh, you're in luck, <laughs> Lord Valor, because not only do I have freelance knowledge, but so does Steven. Uh, we both do freelance art design, that kind of thing. So you'll get kind of a, a double response. I feel like we could do a whole episode on just talking about freelance. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the trick is going to be keeping this short, mm -hmm. at, at least short for us, I would say. The other thing that is fortuitous is that I just talked about this on the Q and A for the Spawn Chunks on Monday, and you can get Johnny's perspective too. So Johnny is oh, nice. a full-time content creator and a podcaster like me. Uh, we do both talked about podcasting. There was an art question, like there was one specifically for art freelance, but a lot of what we talked about went for like a back and forth about just kind of being self-employed, running your own business, that kind of stuff at home. And I think it's one of those things that is kind of universal. It was a lighter conversation. It wasn't quite as in-depth and specific as we might get here. But um, if you go to the Spawn Trunks Q&A episode, we talked about that, I want to say, in the first portion of the Q and A. So it would probably be in the mid, mid of the show. Mm. Um, but you can, you can fast forward and, and we announce when we're moving from like personal questions to podcast questions to content creation questions. So you'll be able to zone in on it pretty, pretty easily. Here is what I will say now and feel free, Stephen, to agree, disagree, or chime in at any point. I would recommend using your name when you're starting out wherever possible. It's really easy branding. It keeps you honest. And <laughs> if you're in any kind of network situation or if you're online amidst all of the people that are also freelancing online, then no one has to remember a really weird URL company name. They don't have to remember that, you know, six feet under is your video podcasting company, right? Uh, if they just remember you and then all they have to do is Google you uh, and video and then you show up, then that's perfect. If you expand and end up with, you know, maybe working with partners or employees down the line or different services, then you can look at a studio name. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't use a studio name if you want to remain more anonymous, if you don't want to be so searchable, that's fine too. But I have found great success in just using my name. It, it makes social media very easy too. You don't have to worry about a, a name for a company being taken. Right. And uh, legally, if you're registering the company, you might have to put something down like your first and last name video production or something, because usually a company name has to be descriptive as to what it does. So, but that doesn't mean that that's what you have to have on your business card. Like you can just say, you know, your name and, and contact information, that kind of thing. Staying on the business side of things, I would use contracts, even if you can't write them yourself. Like if you don't have that kind of language in you, uh, hire someone to write basic service contracts for you, or at least yeah. a template that you can remove your information, client's information and project information and just replace. And then have, have all of the other language be pretty much the same. Uh, it keeps things straightforward. It keeps things binding and uh, make sure that you get someone's signature on that before you start any work. And that will avoid you 
getting into any situation where unfortunately a contract might go south or you know you have to chase someone for payment uh, you can outline things like services expected mm -hmm. scope and revisions in your case possibly uh, deliverables payment expected and payment schedule when are you being paid is a big one i think that people forget about when you're first starting out and sales tax in your state or province depending on where you are what country and what you know what country your client is that kind of stuff can can have an effect so you just kind of let them know what to expect you may find some projects work well as contract rates as you get better but also offer an hourly rate sometimes people can't quite wrap their head around what they want and it might be better for you to have an hourly rate that way if someone is having a hard time making up their mind you're not treading water and watching your hourly rate go through the floor as your low contract price is being eaten up by someone's indecisiveness mm. a lot of the things that i've done in the past with contract rates is say here is the contract rate here are the expectations if you go outside of the expectations, i.e. you want more work from me, we switch to hourly. And so it it's keeps, it keeps your clients honest as well. So they know if they are not organized and are not replying and giving you concise revisions, and if they're, you know, making you jump through a lot of hoops, it's going to cost them. So if they know that in the contract and say, yep, all right, well, we'll just make sure that we only send you those revisions and we send you those revisions on time, then everybody wins. You know, they they have a budget that they can stick to and you have uh, accountability and a safety net in case things go over. I prefer day rates over hourly rates because you can kind of use hourly and day rates together to kind of give your clients a bit of a deal. If they are seeing that you charge, I don't know, $100 an hour, then, and you give a day rate of $300, then, you're, then they're like, well, wait a minute, he's probably working more than three hours. That sounds like a better deal. I'll just hire him for the day. Right. And then you've got a little bit more flexibility as to how you structure that. And then you're not just stuck on three hours and you can do less, you can do more. Like it all depends on what's happening and whether or not you see a future with that client and how much time you want to put in. And speaking of how much you might want to charge, find the going rate in your industry and absolutely start there. Please don't undercharge just because you're a fresh grad. Even though you're just starting out, you have a degree and there's nothing worse than underselling yourself because it's so hard to then upsell and move to a position where you actually are making a decent living because as you get recommendations and word of mouth they'll say oh yeah lord valor was great he was also really cheap that's not what you yeah. want you want the work to be what they recommend and if someone says oh man i don't know he's kind of expensive then you know just that's fine they, that's what it is that you want the person to say yeah but it was totally worth it right? So um, do a little bit of research and to find out what the rates are. If you're working locally, then maybe even find someone to ask. Uh, or if you're working like so many of us do on the internet where it doesn't really matter. Um, but it sounds like if you're looking at like weddings and ceremonies and stuff, you're probably going to be traveling like locally at first anyway. So just see what the going rate is, uh, I would say. Do you have anything to add to payment, Stephen? For myself anyway, I am, I differ. I prefer to do basically estimate how long something's going to take. And then I have, I, you know, I have an hourly rate for myself. And then I, I, I put together an estimate based on how many hours I think it's going to take. And and for me, that's just, so it's just, just to say people are used to spending $800 in a brochure. I'm just throwing that out there. It's, it's pretty expensive for that these days. But if you said $800 in a brochure and that was the going rate, but you're new to it, um, it's going to take you longer. So you might need that quote unquote $800 worth of time to get it done. Um, but as you continue through your career, that $800, you could be like, uh, I can actually do it in half the time that would have, or sorry, I could do it in half the budget, basically. So you might spend four hours worth of, or $400 worth of time in it, so to speak, but still earn the $800. And that's, that's fine. Like if you've gotten to a point in your career where you've, honed all of your skills so that you're now just super efficient that doesn't mean you should start charging people less for this project if you know that this project is an 800 dollars project whether you're a beginner or super proficient you you've earned that buffer later on in life whereas like when you're younger it's still it's still going to be an 800 dollars work experience you're still going to earn the same amount of money but for me it's uh, i like i like setting up that expectation of what something's going to cost and then i stick to it and if for, for me, if I missed the mark, then 
I don't feel right going, whoa, that took way longer than I thought it was going to. So it's actually going to cost you double, which I've, I I know some people who basically give an estimate and they say, well, no, that's just an estimate. And if it ends up costing more, it ends up costing more. And that, that sort of doesn't sit right with me. I feel like if I've given somebody a quote on something, that's something that I stick to. I might say that when I'm, the project's done, I might say that actually was a more complicated thing than I thought it was going to be. Um, so, I mean, th this time, definitely going to stick to the estimate. But if we do something similar than that, we're going to have to sort of take a look at what this costs or or what we can change in the scope of the doc scope of the project in order to make it like if you want this price again, something's going to have to change. Um, but yeah, but it's it's basically I I'm not personally comfortable with doing an hourly rate without uh, a planned limit on it. Because if somebody's like, if you just say, you know, well, I worked 12 hours on it, so it's going to cost X number of dollars. And then when, holy smokes, that's way more than I had budgeted or I'd expected kind of thing. I, yeah. I don't like the idea of dropping a surprise like in the client's lap because then they're just not going to like that. And, and you might reduce the chance of getting work from them later. So that's why I like the idea of tying any kind of overtime to deliverables. So right. here's a contract rate or here's my estimate, depending on what it is. Uh, this estimate includes like three re revision passes. If we go into four, then they know that they had a limit of three so that if they know that they've gone into four, they're not surprised when you say, well, this is going to cost an extra couple hundred bucks than what I had originally estimated because you went into four and five revisions. So it, like it, it makes yeah. it makes things a little bit more, we'll say, palpable on the conversation on the back end because the expectations were set that if things go over, then things get more expensive. That's the key is setting setting the expectations. If, mm -hmm. if you... Yeah, if either one of you are surprised, it's not going to be an enjoyable work experience. So like if all of the expectations are up front, as you said, you know, what is included, what isn't included, as long as you cover all of that, then and no surprises are there, you should be good. I would say from a budgetary perspective too, like don't go overboard. I mean, there's a chance you probably own a lot of the things that you're going to need already because you have a degree in digital media production. But if um, you have to end up buying software, if you have to pick up other things, then uh, don't go for the gold stuff right away. Uh, the the hmm. cheaper that you can do things on your own to get started, then the more money you can actually make profit wise. And then you can reinvest that in the business later, you know, set yourself a goal of completing four or five wedding videos, for example, and then buy yourself the fancy new camera lens that you know will give you more work and allow you to do cooler stuff. But don't go out and buy that first and go super into debt, mm -hmm. hoping that the business takes off. Because like in a lot of things, you don't know what necessarily where this is all going to go. While I did start off doing a lot of freelance illustration and art. I have transitioned into content creation and podcasting. I don't do a lot of contracts for art and graphic design these days. Still some, but I can choose the ones that I want because of the supplementing income that comes in from the other stuff that I do. And ha had I known that was coming, then, you know, there's a couple of things I might not have purchased. So right. keep, keep that in mind. I would 100% take a business class or course if you haven't already it doesn't have to be expensive mm -hmm. or fancy youtube is free the tricky thing with youtube is just finding quality information as opposed to people that are just talking about how much money they make to get clicks so i would say um expect to shift through some bs on youtube or the free content <laughs> but you can also kind of uh, through podcasting or through um, YouTube quickly find out, okay, well, there's a person that seems like they know what they're talking about. They're giving a reasonable expectation and, and video advice about business and how to run a vis business. Specifically, you don't, you don't even have to go just business in general. You can say like, how do I run a videographer business out of my basement? Like there's a YouTube video on that. I'm sure there is. So, yeah. uh, you can really drill down to be specific. And if you find someone that you like that, that, seems to have a really balanced opinion who do they recommend who do they talk about uh, has there been any you know videos that they've done with a friend and then you have a whole other channel to consume so check out some of the free business advice that you can get on online and the sooner that you can get into that then the better if you don't already have an accountant then that's a good person to talk to i yeah pay my accountant a couple hundred bucks a year to do my taxes but because they save me so much money when the way that they file my taxes and knowing that it's done properly and that the CRA here in Canada is not going to come after me for doing it wrong. Peace of mind. And I don't have to yeah. waste the hours it would take me to do it. Plus it's a write-off. So yeah, exactly. It's a business expense. That's another great point. Actually, if you're doing a business out of your home, then depending on, again, your, the rules where you live, you can claim things like a portion of your rent or a portion of your mortgage or 
portion. I mean, if you're traveling for taking videos, a portion of your gas, your mileage on your car, there's all kinds of things that you can write off as business expenses that do a great deal to help you out when you're starting out. I hope that you are better at social media than I am. That would be the best advice that I can <laughs> give you. Uh, the good news is that you're already into video and video is king and I am only just, just getting into video myself. So uh, I think you are probably ahead of the game on that. And with editing skills and stuff, I'm sure you can probably come up with some very, very cool stuff to showcase your work on social media. Yeah. Be open about it. I think that people really dig seeing like not just that you made a cool video, but also how you made the cool video. People love tutorials. Piece of advice that Johnny gave on the show on Monday was like, people look for tutorials. If you're not making them, who is, right? So if, if you've learned how to do something and if you think that making a video tutorial would save somebody else the time it took you to learn it, then share that. That alone is like you're adding value to someone's life because you've given them a tutorial and then that may in turn ultimately give you business down the line. Mm, that's a good idea. I don't know how this would affect you in video as of yet, but for, for me right now, I am glad I'm not doing a lot of freelance art because of all the news around AI and how that's been affecting the industry. So I would research how AI is now and is planning on affecting your industry in video and whatever the niche within that you want to work in and just be aware of it. Don't, don't just say, ah, it won't affect me and, and not worry about it. I think you should really look into it and make sure that's something that you can either protect yourself against uh, or at least be aware of um, what things might you be able to use AI for your advantage in terms of like maybe the behind the scenes stuff, admin stuff, the creative stuff so far for me for AI just seems to be really homogenized and and does not mm -hmm. stand out. It, it seems to get a lot of criticism from peers. So it'd be more, I think, in your interest to be just aware of it and make sure that your videos don't get, you know, scraped for things like all that kind of stuff. I think is really important uh, to stay up on. So it's kind of hard not to these days. It seems to be in the news just about every everywhere. And just to to back up a little bit, I am reminded that LinkedIn Learning is a thing. Oh yes. I'm not sure what it's like in your location, but locally anyway, if um, like in the Halifax area, if you have a library card, and you can go to like HalifaxPublicLibrary.ca or .com, I forget which one it is on there's an e-learning section and there's a portal that takes you from the library to linkedin learning and so you you have free access to everything with your library card so check that out to see if that's something available in in your location because it's um while to youtube like don't i'm not trying to say don't check youtube but the linkedin learning courses are professionally done they're vetted they are it's and sometimes they'll have like a learning path as well so you can start and say i'm going to do business and they'll, they'll start off very very basic and you can actually you may not need a certificate but it would still be like a walk through plan of everything you need to know so that you could earn the certificate but the whole point is that you get an entire sort of set of lessons to fulfill what would be like a mini course for you so yeah it's a it's a great resource and if you want uh you are a member of this community here so feel free to reach out in the discord if you want to talk to Mia or Steven, we both have stuff going on, but like if we see a question in the discord, we'll be more than happy to, to chat with you if you have the time. Uh, I can also send you a link to the show notes if you want for like, cause Steven and I wrote down a lot of what we're talking about. And if you'd like to have that kind of in writing just to kind of review on your own, then I can send you a copy of, of our notes as long as Steven doesn't have a problem with that. Yeah, I'm fine. And I actually like my terms and conditions that I have in my freelance contract, I'm I'm happy to send that along as well. I'll just, I mean, I'll take my company name out of it, but it's, it's not just mine. It's from all the places that I've worked and other freelance designers that I've talked to. We've, we've all kind of got a mishmash of stuff that just sort of has worked for us before. So if you're looking for some, uh, some starting points on terms and conditions, uh, at least from a design perspective, and you can make them your own, I'm happy to send those along as well. Oh, one thing I forgot. Charge friends and family for work. <laughs> oh, yes. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, even if you're not going to charge them your full rate, charge them something. Otherwise, they don't really see the value of your time. Yeah. Um. So, and and, and my full credit goes to my wife for this one. Um, I was doing some freelance work for her best friend at one point, and I really wanted to just do them a solid and do it inexpensively. Um. But she goes, you know what? It's just that's really 
that's really cheap. It's really generous of you, but that's really cheap. And I said, I know, I just, but I just, I don't feel right charging the full amount. And she said, well, what you should do is give them the estimate, show them what the full amount is, then show them like the percentage you're knocking off. And I did, it was like yes, 80% off friends and family did like basically best friend of my wife discount, mm -hmm. 80% off. So now when I sent them the estimate, they're like, holy smokes, dude, this is like, and it was you know, thousands off of what I would charge somebody else. But there's there's no way I'm going to charge them that. Based on my hourly rate, that's literally what I would have charged somebody who was not essentially family. And that's important too, because then if the person that you've done that favor for recommends you to one of their coworkers or someone outside of your immediate circle, then they can say, look, this this is what you'd expect to pay him. He did me a solid, but like, exactly. this is, and they might not even mention it. They might not even mention the favor. They might, someone might say, well, how much did that cost you? And they would just use the top number, not the number that they paid, right? Because they could say, yeah. well, I, I'm going to want now to repay Stephen and make sure that he gets a full contract. Exactly. And that's why I say like, never be afraid to, to ask for the full price of the going rate when you, especially when we're dealing with another business, because it's a, it's a business expense for them too, that they can claim on their taxes. So if you're dealing with a business, charge as much as you can. And I don't, not in like a, in a <laughs> arrogant way, but that's how businesses make money. Like they are, I mean, they're going to push back if it's outside of their budget, but like you should really try to charge as much as you can, especially if you're in an industry that's very busy and, and has to happen. Like you said, wedding videos, like people want them. It's not that, it's not that they are not going to have one. They're going to pick one of you out there to do it. And if you can provide the best service and just be in demand, then like you can also charge for that, you know, and someone yeah. say like, all right, well, I don't want you to do that other wedding across town. I want you to do mine. I'll pay you $200 more than normal. And you'd be just like, absolutely sold, you know, <laughs> like decision made. Yeah. Um, as long as you've not made promises elsewhere, like don't break contracts. But, but yeah, I think, I think that there's certainly something to be said for like, when you're dealing with businesses, it's a lot different than freelancing individuals. I've always had a problem trying to make enough money doing artwork for an individual, someone that wants like a portrait of their family, something of their dog, an avatar. I got pretty fast at those, but those were always a little bit tricky. The avatars that I, I did and drew for people that were like cartoons of, of people were that worked out really well for me were teams, you know, a small mm. team that worked at a hospital, a small team that worked at a, you know, design and development firm. And they just liked my work and they wanted to, you know, ask me to draw everybody six or eight avatars, but it's a business contract. It's not just one person. So you can charge properly and get paid for your time. And so dealing with businesses is a lot easier. Um, again, you might have that kind of back and forth if you're doing wedding videos, but then again, wedding is a big industry. So they're probably used to paying, you know, a lot for stuff like that. Moving into what we have been watching, Steven has gone to the theater, like in person in front of a big screen in like the floofy chairs and stuff. I love it. Not on the TV at home. What, uh, what's been on the big screen? I actually went to see Furiosa. It's, uh, it was one of those ones I'd been, I had forgotten about it. And then when I started seeing the trailers again, I thought, oh yeah, okay. I, I actually quite liked Mad Max. So I wanted to go and, and, and check out this, not the, I guess not the sequel, but the prequel to it. Um, and it was directed by George Miller, who also did, uh, Mad Max. It was written by George Miller and Nick Lathyrus. I might be mispronouncing that, but who also were co-writers of Mad Max. Um, so I was going into this thinking, well, okay, thought visually just, I always like to say visually delicious movie. Like there was just so much cool stuff visually going on in Mad Max that I was really hoping, or I guess ex even expecting that because it's supposed to be the same, the same storyline. Um, but it was it felt like it fell a little bit flat for me. Um, it is, you know, it's as the trailer showed and everybody probably knows it's starring Anna Taylor Joy as Furiosa um, and Chris Hemsworth as Dementis. Uh, Anna t originally was you know, quote unquote supposed to star Charlize Theron, but she really wanted to do it. And I actually quite liked her in Mad Max. I thought she um, she was believably tough. To me, she looked like a badass. And I thought, well, that was just, that was pretty darn cool the way she uh, portrayed the character. Um, but she would have had to play, at, th at this point, she would have had to play a younger version of the same character. So, and they, they would have had to de-age de her significantly. And it was, uh, I'm, I'm glad they didn't do that because 
some de-aging technology is just not great. And when when they used it on her in the old guard, it was just it was just a little bit all over the place because I mean she's she's a stunning human, but you know as people age they sort of get the jawline isn't de- as defined as it used to be when in your younger years, and they were like they were trying to take care of that with de aging in the old guard, and it was just I was distracted by it far more than I w- would like to have been. So as much as I would have loved to see her performance in this again, I just I think it was the right choice not to go with her. I don't know that Anna Taylor Joy was the right choice. She's a great actor as well, but I don't. She wasn't believably tough as nails to me. In it, if that makes sense. I can see that she's a very. She seems slight. She seems very streamlined. You know, I yes, I wouldn't put her in a boxing match and pick her to win. <laughs> Do you know what I no. mean? And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that just it's kind of a fact, right? Yeah, but Charlize Theron, the way that she can, I mean, she's a taller and more imposing figure. Yeah, she's a bigger, she's yeah. a bigger person, I think. I think. I don't know how tall they are. And I feel like if she punched me, she would like really like. You'd know. <laughs> tend, either knock me out or break, break something in my face. Yeah. Where, whereas I didn't get the sense that Anna Taylor Joy could do that. And then there's a couple of times where they showed her walking and I think it was supposed to be like a quote unquote tough guy walk, but it had a bit of a a bit of a, a period piece elegant sway to it i don't know any other way to put it to her. like she's played those other roles and so it feels like it was just not not that she acted poorly i just don't feel like she was the right fit in terms of what i would visually expect and i don't think it yeah i just i don't think she was able to nail it presence wise unfortunately they're almost the same height really five eight yeah five eight versus five ten give or take yeah, see, Charlize Theron just looks taller. And maybe it's the way that she stood as well. Like, she would lean over a bit, a little bit hunched. So she looked... Yeah. There's something about her. Or how tall is Tom Hardy? Do you know offhand? Is he a... Uh... I don't think he's super tall. Yeah, maybe it, Maybe it's just the fact that he's actually... He's shorter than Charlize Theron, yeah. <laughs> That's all it takes. <laughs> so, the, respectively, it was uh, 1.72 meters, 1.75, and 1.77 for... Taylor Joy, Hardy, and Theron across the board. Theron being the tallest of all of them. And if and if they put her in something that was a little bit, I'm not sure if she wore any kind of like a boot or something. B- boots that made her taller, but yeah. either way, she she had a more imposing presence. And I thought, like again, I just thought she was mm-hmm. she was believably able to kick my tail easily, hands down. Whereas I don't feel like Anna Taylor Joy could have. Not that I'm a tough guy, I just you know what I mean. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to be that guy. Like, oh, there's no way that this chick could beat me up. And I guess on the acting front, this is Chris Hemsworth as Dementis. I, I, I wanted to like him in it, but I don't. <laughs> I didn't. I and I feel bad saying it because like he was just. He came across like too showy and charismatic to be a believable big player threat in a place like the wastelands. Visually, he came across as too polished as well like he's just you know full body wax like just typically the way he would have been for thor and stuff like that but it's just this is a place called the wastelands and and maybe i'm just in the minority here but i don't understand how all of these men could be hairless all of these women have perfectly manicured brows when they don't even have a mirror like (laughs) what's going on like give me give me bushy eyebrows in period pieces where they don't have any resources to it just it drives me crazy and sometimes it just maybe it shouldn't but it just sucks me out of the uh, the world they've created when there's just some things that don't align and i mean on that note like some of the clothes that they wore in this one just felt way too clean yeah compared to the first movie so there's like these things that just didn't match up between the first movie and the prequel and i feel bad saying that but it's just it's the reality of it Oh, and it's funny, though, because I read some reviews on Chris Hemsworth's performance online. I feel like I'm in the minority on this one. Like, a lot of people loved it and felt like he was just chilling, the perfect, you know, creepy villain to across from Furiosa. And I'm just like, I don't know. It just felt like there's a lot of stuff that didn't quite fit the way I wanted it to. I'm struggling to remember anything that I've seen him in outside of Avengers that I've actually liked him in. I think most of the time it's been just interviews of him. I like him. Like he's a great yeah. person and personality. He's fun in interviews and he seems like he's a really good dude. 
I mean, it wasn't a good movie, but he was funny in the all female Ghostbusters movie. I can't remember the full title of that, yeah. but the yeah. he was good in that. And I'm trying to remember the other things. There's a couple of action movies on Netflix that I just didn't get to. But again, like, I'm not sure if he's really acting much in those outside of just like running from explosions and shooting stuff. I don't know. It looks very kind yeah. of 80s action movie. So uh, Shakespeare's probably not. But I don't know that I've seen much that he's done outside of the Marvel films, which I mean, that's not nothing because that's like many, many, many movies, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But I'd, I'd like to see him like see if he's got dramatic acting chops at all and, and and not that he needs to go down that route for his career or whatever but i just i'm curious to see what he can do because this yeah. was i don't know there were just some some things in the performance just felt a little too over the i don't want to say comedic but i don't know if comedic is the right word but it just felt oh just a little bit too much over the top the, the way he said some things and like just it felt uh oh, just just tone it back for me i know he's a very funny dude like i know he's a very funny guy and uh he's in comedies that I've heard that he's in that I've not seen, his co-stars are always like, oh my gosh, like he's just a natural, like he's really good at everything. And I would imagine just because of his age, like he's just, um, you know, you can only keep in that kind of shape for so long. Uh, and yeah. I imagine he probably wants to do these kind of roles while he can, you know, and, and hasn't really branched yeah. off into like rom-coms, you know, just because like, I'd imagine it's just not something that he's like, I can do those later, you know? Yeah. And that's just me being speculative. Maybe he just doesn't like them at all. Like maybe he just likes these big physical roles. I could see that too. Like if I, I mean, I, you know, I spent a lot of time working out. If I was an actor and in these movies, I could see myself preferring the kind of action movies that would keep me entertained and going and challenged, I think physically. Mm. But then you've also seen, you know, actors like Ryan Gosling that seem to be able to do it all. Like one movie, they're dancing. The next movie, they're Ken. The next movie, they're an action star, like inside of an action movie. Yeah. with the fall guy i haven't seen that but that does look really good it's good it's it's fun oh you've seen it cool yeah i i'm listing and i'm i'm wondering if this is ever something that's going to cross my uh my screen because i really really did not like mad max the new one. Oh, really no uh I remember watching the uh, mel gibson movies when i was a kid and liking those but like i was also young but i just i really thought it was just long loud and boring and I did not find any point to the story in the first Mad Max. Like they drove, I can't remember whether it was left or right for the first hour and 40 minutes of the movie. And then they just turned around and drove back the other way. And that was the whole, <laughs> that was the whole film. And I was yeah. just like, okay. There's not much more to this one. Yeah. Okay. So um. <laughs> I'm probably going to skip it then. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. If you threw it on in the background, like I, I thought, I thought the first, for me, visually, I thought the first one was really cool. I thought the characters really neat. I love the greediness of it. I thought, I, I'm not familiar with Mad Max from the first one. So I, it was my introduction to it. So I thought there's a lot of neat stuff to it. But yeah, there's, there's not, it's not a, I guess you could say that there is more to this story in the sense that it's, it's the background, the background in between like, I'm going to mess up the places of the name, but like the bullet farm versus the, uh, gas town versus another one so that it, it talks about like their interaction and sort of like their agreement and the push and pull with the economy in that sense mm -hmm. um so it, it's it's this this movie literally takes place well it, it takes place a while before and then leads up to the exact point where the next movie takes off oh which is interesting but i felt what <laughs> it was also telling because i felt like mad max was better visually and as soon as they started showing clips from like the, the basically the movie ended and then they showed some clips from Mad Max tagged onto the end of it. I'm like, yep, that's better. That's better. That makeup's better. <laughs> They're nice and gritty. Their clothes are dirtier. And it's just like all of these little things that in my mind were <laughs> that much better. It's like, why would you do that to yourself? Like you're just you're basically now showing that you didn't quite weren't quite up to the same mark. The makeup. I could I couldn't believe how clean and tidy and well blended the makeup was in this. It was just supposed to be people taking tar or grease or whatever sticking in their face and smearing it around but it was like just perfectly blended and the creepy guy with the teeth mask the uh wish i could remember what his name is now his he had perfectly perfectly blended um theatrical makeup around his eye like it was just so not in line with what you would expect from this type of movie yeah where there's sand and smoke and dirt everywhere yeah exactly and so like if, if I went back to that, the whole 
cinema scale thing that I was talking about earlier in the show, I, I basically went through that and came out to uh, what it claimed is a fairly objective scale. I got a six and a half or seven out of ten. And while I didn't agree necessarily with how they went about things in their their uh, their rating scheme, I actually felt that was probably pretty pretty fair and accurate. It just it felt like it wasn't quite there. I mean, there's a couple of things where I felt like I'd like to go up a couple points and down a couple points. And I made it overall given it a seven out of ten and seven and a half or seven and a half out of ten just because the entertainment factor wasn't there enough for me. Like I didn't leave there thinking like, well, I just wasted my money. So I probably I might have erred on a half a point l- higher, but it was a <laughs> I was surprised that it came pretty close to what I would have given it myself if it was a subjective rating. How about you? What have you been watching the last little while? So I have resubscribed to Disney Plus this month on purpose because mm. last night the Acolyte premiered with two episodes. You'll right. see a mix of reviews out there. Some people have seen the first two episodes and are talking about it. And then some people have seen the first four with like a premiere event. And they're talking about Mm. that. Uh, Anybody that's doing that is not talking spoilers. They're only talking about what is publicly available in the first two episodes. And a lot of people are really not getting to many spoilers either on the reviews that I saw, which is, which is good. Is that how they do it? Typically it's a, it's a, a release event. Is that how they get to see four episodes in advance? Yeah, they invite reviewers to go watch it ahead of time so that then they can go back and have time to record and edit and get ready to publish their YouTube videos so that the moment that the first two episodes drop, then you'll see like, how does somebody have a 20 minute edited YouTube video with opinions and thoughts about this 10 hours after it premiered, right? Right. And so what they've done is, and because it's a Disney Plus streaming service event, they invite people to theaters to like have like an actual red carpet. And, and that's good for the stars too, because like these people are in green screens, I think a lot of the time. And so to be out and see fans and everything like that is it's, they make a big kind of event out of it. Okay, cool. I really kind of shied away from anybody that's reviewing episodes three and four because I don't want those kind of spoilers or even just like clues or the only thing that I, I did catch someone said, uh, which is my first impression was that it's a very slow start and you have to remember that it's a series and that you're only seeing the first two episodes of what is essentially going to be a season long mystery where there's eight episodes. So you're only really barely scraping the first act probably in the first two episodes and you get a lot of questions, Mm -hmm. right? And so it doesn't feel very fulfilling, but that's good. I don't want it to be episodic. Like I don't want it to have a resolution at the end of every hour. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they do end up being kind of cryptic in a lot of ways. Um, but someone that said, hey, look, if you're feeling that before you get on the internet and start poo-pooing everything, let me tell you that they start to fill things out in episode three and then they move things forward as as things go on. <laughs> and that's all he said. I don't remember this person uh, who they were, but that's all he said about episodes three and four was like, if you've got this feeling at the end of one and two, just know that you just have to sit in it for a week <laughs> and then things will start to move on. If I may though, it feels like if you're only going to drop two episodes, it feels like you may want to include something mm-hmm. for us peasants who don't get to see all four episodes to like make us want to go into the third week. So just yeah. Not not that you're listening right now Disney, but uh just just do that, okay? Just don't assume we're going to want to go see the third one if you don't drop any hooks. They could have just left it on the first one. The, the first one had a better ending than, than the second. And so I feel mm-hmm. like they could have released the first one and said like the next one comes out next week uh, and you'll just have to wait. And then because you're watching like a series, the second one having like a lot of unanswered questions, you're like, well, whatever, it's a mystery show and it's only episode two. But I feel like you like that, that two hour investment, you do want that bit of catharsis or resolution that you just don't really get. But I'm, mm-hmm. I'm past that now with series, especially when they're eight, episodes and not like 12 or more it's just like i treat it like an eight hour movie i've only just finished my popcorn right (laughs) so it's yeah you're not you're not really going to get a lot out of it and so and so i'll I'll say right away anybody that is posting online saying that this is a shit show it's the end of star wars they are clickbaiting you 
And mm. the, there are some points that people are making that are valid, but it's not the end of the world. It's not Shakespeare. It's not the Mandalorian. How could it be? But it's also not solid gold shit either. Right. The one thing I think is really going to throw people is the marketing. I feel like the trailer and all the hype around this has really hyped it up more than they should have. The trailer looks exciting. It looks Star Wars y. It looks adventurous. It looks like a cinema experience. And I think it's going to bite Disney in the ass when it comes to reviews because of some very misdirected expectations. And I can't get into too much without spoilers. Mm. But there's a big misdirect in the marketing and the trailer that really bothers me. And it was disappointing. Now, in a way, that are really nerding out and like reading all the blogs and digging in the behind the scenes and all the stuff might have kind of guessed where this was going beforehand. But I like going into this stuff pretty cold. I like watching the trailer and then that's it. And I'll go in yeah. and I don't read the blogs. I don't read the casting. Because if you accidentally read how many episodes someone's in it, in, then you're like, well, I know which episode they die in. <laughs> like that, you know, that kind of I stuff. Know. So I don't, I don't dig into that. Not the main character. <laughs> exactly. Right. So yeah, there's a bit of a bait and switch with the trailer, which I was not expecting. Mm. We'll get into more in that as people have seen it and we can talk about it with spoilers on the show. Um, but that, that was the only first real negative impression out of, outside of like the slower start. Um, because it is very much kind of like a, a buddy cop show, mystery, you know, crime procedural. It's, n it's not uh, getting your ship and run from the bad guys sort of stuff that you see in a lot of Star Wars films. Okay. But in that light, from a production standpoint, because it's Disney and Star Wars and they basically print money, most of it looks really, really good. And it looks like Star Wars. You don't question anything. Environments are seamless. The, the volume that they're filming in and all that looks amazing. Uh, it's a good mix of practical effects, puppetry, makeup, real gadgets. Like if something is like a little robot thing that, that moves or mm. is a droid, it's something that an actor can touch uh droid you know like a, a power droid like a gonk droid walks by and you're like that's a dude in a suit like that is probably a small child wearing like you know dryer hoses and booties <laughs> walking mm -hmm. with a garbage can on their head like it just and I, I say that in jest but that's that's really kind of what it looked like um and it just it reminds you of the the 70s and 80s star wars the first trilogy and the you know jim henson creature shop stuff and the ilm stuff that went into that so they really nailed the look and the cool thing about it is that it's set 100 years before the rise of the empire. And I've okay. been looking as I've been talking, but I can't seem to find an actual screenshot of the text. But essentially, I'll paraphrase, 100 years before the rise of the empire, the Jedi are keepers of a peaceful time in the galaxy where there's no war. However, there are some powerful outliers that are using the force outside of the jedi in the far corners the secret corners of the universe a lone assassin is risking discovery by executing their revenge and like dot 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 like that's where we start hmm. you pick up with with that and so what's nice about that is that there's not going to be any cameos from anybody that you know in the skywalker saga because they're not even palpatine isn't even born yet it's a hundred years before the third movie that you haven't seen. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's 132 years before the battle of Yavin. So before Skywalker becomes the death star killer, like you're 130 years out. So you're like two generations really. And so it's, it's essentially the end of what's called the high Republic, which has different Jedi costumes. There's a lot of Jedi. They're kind of everywhere and they're more, authoritative like they tend to throw their weight around a little bit more i don't know how much i like that but it's it's one of those mm. things where th their wisdom starts to be a little condescending sometimes so it's it's like when uh, the good guys become bad guys in your favorite series you're just like oh, i don't know if i like that so it, yeah. it's, it's got a little bit of a different take but i think some of that could also be first impressions of some of the characters as well because they all are a little bit different the acting from most of the cast is very good. The main Jedi Master Soul, played by Lee Young Jae, and his Padawan Jackie Lon. Uh, that's Daphne Keene, actually, from Logan. She played X-23, Lara. 
she's now a lot older and playing a Jedi mm. Padawan. So she went from like X-Men <laughs> to Jedi Padawan. I mean, she's done other stuff in between, but like checking the boxes, Daphne, like yeah. way to go. No kidding. And <laughs> she is immediately noticeable and good. And just her, her dialect and her pathos and how stiff she is as a, as a rule following Padawan and how stern she is. I recognize her for a second. It's like, I feel like I recognize her before. It's when she scowls and you're like, I've seen that before. And then when you realize <laughs> who it is, you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, totally. Because I mean, the last time we saw her, she was like 12 or 13 in Logan. Right, right, and now right. she's probably closer to like 18 or 20. I'm not sure how old she is, but, um, she's still a young person. She's still very much a young Padawan, but it works very well. And she's talented and hard to recognize because she is a half human, half feline. So she's got like orange makeup and like horns and a wig. So like, and her, her skin tone is more white than it is flesh colored. So you'd never mm. pick her out of a lineup unless you knew it was her. The, the main protagonist is played by um, Amandla with an L Stenberg. That's Osha. And that's the, the character that you follow through the first two episodes anyway. And I feel like we're going to be following this female character for the most of the, the show. Uh, she's very good in her role. She's very natural. She has to say a lot of Star Warsy stuff. She's like a mechanic. Mm. So she's got to prattle off, you know, techno babble all the time. But when she's talking about who she is, where she's been, what she does in this, she is the suspect of the murder of a Jedi. And that's why she's kind of in the forefront of the story. And right. she is the former Padawan of Master Soul. So she has left the Jedi Order. And I think all of this is from the trailer. So it's not really a spoiler. And so that gives her some dynamic. You know, it reminds me of Ahsoka Tano, who also left the Je Jedi Order before she became a knight. And so we don't know why Osha left the Jedi Order. They hint at it, but it, we've, they've not really spelled it out. So these are all those questions that they just haven't answered. And that's fine because I'm assuming we're going to get some flashbacks because they keep on referencing an event, a fire from Osha's childhood that orphaned her, thus thrusting her into the Jedi Order because she was force sensitive. And it seems to be a traumatic event for multiple characters in the show. And so I think right. that will probably see that through a flashback or, or get more information about that as the thing goes on. She also plays May, which is the main antagonist that we see in the trailer. She is um, the person that's fighting the Jedi. When you see any kind of Kung Fu stuff happening in the trailer, this is May, the other, the sister, but it's played by the same actor. So she's playing twins. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And it, Again, like, because I didn't really read into all the backstory, I missed it, but it's, they're both, they're totally in the, in the poster. Amanda Stenberg is, is in the poster twice, once with a hood and a mask on, and the other one, she's just got her face out. So they're using the same actor to play this, uh, the, the two different characters. And I really, I want to say I like her, but it's really hand, heavy handed on the, like, look, mom, I'm evil, sort of like scowly. Mm. Do you remember when Chris Evans was a bad guy in November Man? And it like Didn't he had actually a, see that he had a mustache. It was completely not. Was it the gray gray man? Oh, was it gray man? I think a November man is the wrong movie. I mean, regardless of what it's called. I know which one you mean. Yeah. yeah. It was a Netflix film. Ryan Gosling yeah, yeah. was, the, was the protagonist and, and, um, Chris Evans was the bad, bad guy. I say bad guy in quotation marks. He was laughing. <laughs> I, I, I could almost see the finger quotes as you were saying. Yeah. Bad like guy. he's so, he's so likable in everything that he does. It's just hard to like dislike him as a bad guy. And he was like kind of evil, smarmy evil in, in that movie. And anyway, you, she's not like mustache twirling. She's not that bad, but it, <laughs> it's, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit, I don't want to say unbelievable, but I almost wish that she had gone or the character had been written more like a Harley Quinn, like more like a sister gone crazy as opposed to like an angry sister right. because she's just the anger. She's just, it's arrogance. It's not anger. So it, it just feels kind of like, why are you acting this way? Like it, just, it feels a little bit strange. Um, not mm. the end of the world. And it's also the, only the first two episodes, it, the, the character, it, I don't know whether these are the first shots that they did, the last shots they did, who knows? So it, she could grow throughout it. So that's a small, a small thing. Everybody else is pretty straightforward. Uh, the Jedi speak kind of slow and funny as most Jedi do. Uh, there's a lot of techno babble. Somebody at some point says, I've got a bad feeling about this. Like, just that kind of stuff is pretty standard. <laughs> 
the biggest problem that I have, which is where I think a lot of the tinfoil hat Star Wars fans that are are shitting all over this are getting their valid points is the writing and the dialogue is a bit phoned in. It feels like someone is trying too hard to make a Star Wars show, quote unquote, in the first couple of episodes. So there's just a lot of just like Star Warsy stuff. Whereas you get one or two of things like that in a Mandalorian episode, it feels like every scene is a Star Warsy thing. Mm. It's like, look, we're making Star Wars. Hey, did you catch the thing about Star Wars? Here's another thing. It Star. Did you know that we're making Star Wars? <laughs> so it 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 does get a little bit heavy-handed in that way. They're going full CW with it. The problem with it, I think, is that the dialogue and the the, the rules of the world are inconsistent, and that is where they lose me. Right. And I guess a really good example is the series creator and showrunner is also the writer for episode one and the director for episode one and two. So like that is a whole lot of people that Leslie Headland does not have to answer to. Right. And I feel like it would have been better if maybe she was writing and show running the first two episodes, but somebody else was directing. Like I right. just, I feel like there just wasn't enough checks and balances in those first two episodes there are other writers coming throughout the series and other directors coming throughout the series so this was just the kickoff i've not seen anything else that headlands has done i recognize russian doll that she was a producer and a showrunner on but i didn't watch it it's a good show i mean she was also a producer on the bachelorette i don't know how she landed a gig at star wars <laughs> like i really don't know how this came about it's not like it's Bryce Dallas Howard where I know other things that she's been in and directed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so I don't have that career coming to it. But I mean, it's fine. You got to give people new starts. I don't know. Outside of Daphne Keen, I don't know any of the actors in this. Uh, oh, sorry. Carrie Ann Moss. I, like, yeah. I, obviously, I recognize her. But, but a lot of the main actors that are, are talking on screen a lot of the time, no clue who they were before this, which is fine. I like that. I, cool. I love yeah. that about this for the show. And I love it for these people too. There's a really cute clip online of Amanda Stenberg getting a welcome to the Star Wars family message from Hayden Christensen. Nice. She loses her ever loving mind. Like it just, she <laughs> squeals and like, you can almost see the people in the, in the soundstage going like, Ooh, that was loud. <laughs> like it was, she was, <laughs> she peeked in the red. <laughs> oh yeah. There was, there was no holding back. That was n absolute genuine reaction. She got handed a, a iPad and had no idea what was on it. She had no nice. idea that he was going to say hello to her. That was cute. So I'm happy for the actors that are, are involved. I mentioned that it's a lot like a cop drama but it's a lot like a cop drama. If you've seen mm -hmm. any episode of Law and Order, it's going to feel eerily familiar. And that's the other thing about the writing. It borrows from just about everywhere. Oh, that's too bad. I've seen scenes in it from The Fugitive. I've seen scenes in it from Lord of the Rings. Some of the plot devices they're using are straight out of Rings of Power on Amazon. They pull from every Star Wars thing that you can imagine. TV, um, animation, Clone Wars, they do it all. And I guess that in a way, I feel like if I was to guess, Disney is probably saying this is a brand new property. It's a brand new era. It's a hundred years before anything is familiar. So we can't do cameos. Like we can't keep people satiated by dropping Luke Skywalker into this thing. Yeah. And so they're just pushing all of the familiar stuff, which is just, it's for me, what it does, it makes you feel like they don't believe in the show and they just. They could have done something really, really different. And it's, it's different, but it's like, it's only different because we've not seen it in Star Wars. It's still safe, really safe because you've seen this story a million other times before. They're just putting it in Star Wars and that's what's making it different. And so that's a little bit, um, a little bit obvious for me. They make up for it mm -hmm. a little bit with how very well it's shot. The fight scenes when they do happen are choreographed very well it's a little slow at sometimes in terms of the moves but like i could i could kind of brush that off as like well they're jedi it's not kung fu like these force people kind of know what the next move is that's how they're so good with lightsabers so the fact that they're kind of blocking the opponent's kick before the person makes the kick makes sense and even though the moves are a little bit slower physically what you get as a benefit of that is longer camera shots 
So even in the fight mm. scenes, you're, there's not a lot of quick cuts. You'll like, you'll see the person, the cameraman, like walk with the fight as it goes on. And that's really cool. It does remind me nice. of Daredevil a little bit, nothing that extravagant and not that fast, but it has kind of like some intention. Uh, a lot of Jedi lightsaber stuff have form. There's different forms. I think there's seven forms of lightsaber fighting. And you can see in the hand to hand combat, the same sort of thing. Oh, you're going to kick me a lot. I'm going to do this form. The Jedi, when they fight are very rigid, they're very up, very straight. Uh, if mm -hmm. you've ever seen a Kung Fu movie where the person that's being attacked really doesn't raise their fist, they just kind of move out of the way every time, like just dodge this, dodge that step sideways. And they just, the person that's attacking them, that's angry, just keeps on freaking missing. And that's what they do a lot <laughs> in this, but it looks really cool because Jedis have got robes and there's like, sometimes the bad guy has got a laser or something. So like that kind of stuff is cool. It brings like the sci-fi, uh, Star Wars nature to it. Um, but it's, it's a little bit predictable someone goes to the edge of a cliff, you're like, oh, they're going to fall off and then someone's going to catch them with the force. And then 30 seconds later, that's what happens. So like on one hand, you're like, well, it's fine. It's not bad that it happened. I'm kind of, it's kind of dumb that I could predict that it could happen, but it's, it's not like it makes or breaks the show. But I think that people are just, again, through the marketing, I think they've had high expectations and they're getting a good show, but they wanted like a fantastic show. And I think, and I hope it ramps up, I think because of the way that they have to point this, because at this stage of the game, the acolyte and there's in the trailer, you see a red lightsaber. So you're, if, if you assume, cause mm. I don't know that there's a Sith involved somewhere, this is like the first return of the Sith in like a thousand years. And there's questions about that because they said the same thing in the Phantom Menace about Darth Maul. They're like, he can't be a Sith. They've been extinct for a thousand years. So what happens? Like, is there a cover yeah. up? Did the Jedi win and decide not to tell anybody? Like what, how does this happen? Do the Sith win and just like skirt off into solitude for the next 50 or 80 years? And depending on the timeline, which I'm not super familiar with, one of these characters could potentially be the master of Darth Sidious. So the emperor's master could be one of these bad guys that we're dealing with in this show. Oh, interesting. So that's intriguing to me. And I think that's, that's an interesting way to, to do that and kind of like show you kind of like the origin of the Sith. That's what I thought this was going to be. And it's not quite that. I, I thought it was going to be a little bit more ancient history. I didn't think they were going to go only a hundred years. I thought they were going to go a lot farther. I thought they were going to go more towards the old Republic with this. That would have been pretty cool. Now, some of it is a little hokey as you do get with some Star Wars. And at first I was like, this is just really inconsistent and odd. But as you find out later, Yord Fandar is a temple guard. He has a yellow lightsaber. So these would have been like the Jedi temple guards, oh, sort of like cool. paladins. You know more about them in Clone Wars, the cartoon. So if you're not familiar with that, you might not know a lot about them. But they are essentially the Jedi's version of like the red guards that the Sith have. You know, the, the dudes right. that the Emperor heads that are like head to toe in red Imperial guards. This is a, a temple guard. But as such, he doesn't get out of the temple much and he's a rule follower. And so his really stiff nature that doesn't sit with you well in the first episode, it gets explained to you more in the second episode. You're like, oh, okay. It makes a little bit more sense. I will also say that I got more information about this from like some of the reviews and some of the people that are a little bit more steeped in Star Wars than I am. And they were saying that it makes up for his stiffness in that it's not a, it's not a, a acting decision as it is written into the character that he's supposed to be a little out of water, you know, fish out of water because he's out in the universe on this mission with Master Saul. But he's also like, this is like one of his first times out of the temple because he's, he's right. a temple guard. So it, it's, he's very stiff and formal. And I feel like they're trying to use that to wash away these other inconsistencies. And this is the main issue that I have with the writing. And that is they'll say something like a Jedi only draws a lightsaber to kill very cop like, right? Like don't draw your gun unless you yeah. tend to use it. Right. But then the very next scene, they show a Jedi drawing a lightsaber and not killing anybody. And you're like, mm. so do they not follow the rules? <laughs> like, what are the rules? Uh, it, it, it really kind of makes it 
hard to figure what's going on. And then th this Yord Fandar like draws his lightsaber anytime he can. He's always got his hand on it. So it's like, what? So then are Jedi temple guards just like quick to draw? Is that just, is that his nature? Or is that just some inconsistency in the writing and the, and the, the show running? We'll, we'll say inconsistencies in the universe, the rules of the universe. Yeah. In one scene, uh, again, not to get in any spoilers, um, saying that a character is dead. I watched them die, you know, pathos scene staring right down the lens only to say the exact opposite two scenes later. I believe you when someone says that person is alive. And then hmm. in another scene, the next episode fighting the character that you said that you saw die. It's like, but <laughs> you're either lying or the show is just not really connecting the dots, you know, like, so why are you as a character lying? And if you are, you need to do a better job of conveying that to the audience. Cause like you're speaking slowly. It's a Jedi that says it. And you're just like, okay, well, Jedi's just speak very matter of factly. So why would they lie? They're not, they're the good mm. guys. They're not supposed to lie. Now that said, Kenobi lied to Luke and said that Darth Vader killed his father. It's a, it's a twist on the truth, but it's not yeah. like, so I get that. But at the same time, you have to clearly communicate that because the problem is that you're watching a cop drama mystery. You're trying to solve a, a series of murders as, as to not so much who done it, but as to why it's being done. And when you have these misdirections, you're like, well, wait a minute. Is this meant to be a plot twist or are the writers just straight up lying? Hmm. You don't feel that you can put the effort into trying to figure out who done it, trying to figure out the mystery, like Ooh, which way it's going to go. It's like, well, I can't make any guesses because I don't know if the facts that I have are universe facts or script facts as in like, right. mm, that's a little bit too obvious. We should misdirect the audience. I don't know. Say he saw her die. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. That'll, that'll throw them off the trail. Like it just like that kind of stuff pisses me off. So there's inconsistency in the show running, which is again, <laughs> why I'm just like, Leslie Headland doesn't have a lot of track record for me in terms of what she's done. <laughs> you're going to have to do better than the bachelorette. If you're going to do show running for star Wars, <laughs> Uh, that's low hanging fruit. I realize, but there's, there's a few things about the show that I'm just like, yeah, that's, it's not like I'm being nitpicky. These are big misses, big whiffs. Yeah. You're up to bat and you missed that. And if I'm picking up on that stuff, uh, then so is everybody else. And cause I love star Wars. So like, it takes a lot for me to be just like, this is total bullshit. So in conclusion, I subbed to, to Disney plus for June for this show. I'll probably be subbing into July. So I'll probably have two months to watch this show. I'll have other stuff to catch up on. I've been watching the Bad Batch and the Star Wars Tales of the Empire. That's been fairly cool too. There are a lot of heavy handed reviews online. You're going to see people calling the show woke and boring. I disagree. It's not boring. It is a little bit slow, but it's a, it's a different kind of show. People thought Andor was slow too, but that show was awesome. So I think if they do it right, if they can course correct, for people that haven't seen the rest, then I think that it could have some payoff because of the stakes and because of where we know it has to go in terms of like potential Sith and how they handle all of this. I like the main characters. I like Master Saul. I like Jackie. Jackie is the name of his Padawan. I like Jackie a lot. Daphne Keen is, is great. So there are some things that you get attached to and you want to see through. So that's good. I feel like it's got some potential but anything that you see really coming down on this and saying it's the end of Star Wars, I wouldn't even bother with the review because I feel like that review, <laughs> that person is like almost doubling down in order to get clicks and rage people. Like it's just, it's just, it's not that bad. If someone is coming down on it like so terribly, I really think that they're doing it on purpose or they're just, they just have their expectations so, so unreasonably high that, right. that I think that they have nowhere else to go but down. And I think that that's not the case. I think that there's a lot of potential in the show. It was interesting to see some black fans reviewing the show and calling out the haircut that, that Yord Vander has, because it's the same haircut that Killmonger has. And like several other black characters in sci-fi in video games oh, yeah. have, like it's all the same haircut. And they were just saying like, no one has their haircut like that. And even if they did, why does it, why do these characters in these, in these shows 
all have the same haircut. When you line them up next to each other, it's really obvious. And it's it's the dreadlocks, but then like off to the side, like the half the half mohawk kind of fold over thing. I wouldn't have said it was it not you know a, a, a black fan commenting on it on YouTube. I was like, all right, well, like that's your zone. So if you're saying like this is bullshit, then I'm like I'm I'm with you. I believe you. I'd never clued in, but like I don't necessarily notice the haircuts of of Caucasian people either. You know? Yeah. For, I mean, for example, all the Jedi's tend to have all the men Jedi tend to have long hair. There's not a lot of, uh, any Padawan has like buzz cut hair. Cause that's kind of how they differentiate them. The main character, master Saul, he's played, um, I believe he's a Korean. Yeah. He was, uh, he was the main actor in squid games. Yes, that's right. That's remember. I remember someone saying that, but he has a very standard <laughs> out of time Asian haircut. It's just long and straight. You know, like it's not, yeah. <laughs> you've seen it in a thousand samurai movies. It's not anything new or fancy, but I don't know anybody that's commenting on how stereotypical that is. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. it's, you know, to, to each will have their own experience when you come to it. Uh, I will say that it's really cool to see how many different ethnicities are in Star Wars now. And I don't think that's just Acolyte. I feel like I've seen that in other things, video games and and stuff like that. So I feel like they're representing a lot more people. And then you're seeing a lot more aliens too, which is nice. Uh, I noticed when I watched the review from the Blind Wave crew on YouTube, they're really knowledgeable about Star Wars and have like, they've memorized mm. a lot of alien names and they get excited when they see, oh, that's the first one of these that we've ever seen in live action. It's some alien that they've seen in the Clone Wars, like, 10 years ago, I'm just like, I don't know what you're talking about, but you're excited yes. about it. So that's cool. So <laughs> they're putting in a lot of different aliens because I think that between the special effects, the animatronics, the CG, you can really make some believable aliens. Like when somebody walks in and says like, that's her, she's the one that did it. And it's like a hammerhead shark alien with a beard. You don't question for a minute. Like you're just like, that's, <laughs> I don't know how they did that, but that looked like he was talking. And it's not like he's a full CG character either, because like you can see his coat brush up against the door when he walks in, like there's stuff like right. that is, re is really good. So there's a lot of good about it. I, I don't want to poo poo it. I just, I really hope that they can take the, the larger writing issues and, and rein them in a bit and, and get it a little bit more focused. If I were to bring it back to where I started the conversation today, just briefly, if you had to give these two episodes a rating out of 10 so far, what would it be? <laughs> Oh, uh, let me just look at your plot, attraction, theme, acting, dialogue, cinematography, editing, soundtrack, directing, and the it factor. Well, the it factor gets a big plus. That's like all this cool Star Wars stuff. So that gets like a, yeah. a bump for me. I'd put it at like a seven. Seven? Okay. Yeah. Like it's very watchable. I'm curious to see where it goes. Whereas with Mandalorian, I would be excited for the next episode. Like cannot wait. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? Absolutely. So I, I feel like if that's where I am with the Mandalorian and not, not every episode of the Mandalorian was perfect, but if I'm at the excitement level for Mandalorian, then I'm at the curiosity level for this, which I would say is, is a seven. That's a good way to put it. Curiosity level versus excitement level. And I might change my mind. That's, that's a seven for the first two episodes. So that could be up. That could be down mid season to end season. You know, like you, like you said, if they drop mm -hmm. the ball in the ending, then I could, I could be uh, not happy with it. Apparently they said the, the, they said that there's a cliffhanger in episode four, but like whatever it's, it's episode four. Like, it's not like, you know, it's not the end of the season. And the showrunner has said that they did not want to end the season with a big cliffhanger. They kind of wanted to tell a complete story in the first season i guess they're hoping to get right. a second season so we'll we'll see where it goes moving into the internet minute the citadel cafe is of course brought to you by you dear listener uh, you are supporting us on patreon and we very much appreciate it if you get value out of the show please consider putting a little bit of value back in you can become a member just like other folks at patreon.com slash the citadel cafe Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member-only Discord server and access to the Barista Cut bonus audio. Sometimes we record extra audio at the end of the show and you get access to that. You can also join us live here on Wednesday nights when we have a chance to record this. We have a few people in the live chat now. Special thanks to our Bean Counter patrons, Cosmic and Smurf588. Thank you ever so much for your support on this episode. Patron count is at 26 that is steady on from the last time we recorded. If you would like to be patron number 27, visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. My pick this week is short and sweet, but maybe louder than you thought. This is the Lego <laughs> Retro Radio. Retails for $129.99 Canadian. Set number 10334. 
906 pieces, a little bit light for that price count, but it is a very pretty design. It is 12 inches high with the antenna extended, nine inches wide and two and a half inches deep. It's nice. Roughly the size of a transistor radio in real life. So it's not a small piece of kit. Uh, you can see on the website, they've got pictures of a, of a woman holding it. So you can get a good idea about how, how big it is. It's one of those sets from Lego icons that is a really good representation of a beautiful vintage or familiar object. In this case, it's a 1970s transistor radio. And it's reimagined with Lego very, very well. I think it's very, very cool. Not just a pretty thing on your shelf, though. It's designed to put your phone in and play music with a sound brick, which is new to me. And there's no details on what a sound brick does, which is a bit cryptic. They really did not hmm. advertise much about that. But through a little bit of digging on the website, it sounds like the sound brick has just a couple of pre recorded sounds that it will play as you dial the knobs on the radio, the needle on the, um, the radio stations goes back and forth and you can kind of hear the sound brick kind of dictate what you would hear if you were scrolling through radio stations, you know, interesting. It's not playing anything that's copyrightable. It's all kind of made up just for this piece. I think it's just kind of meant for the immersion. However, putting your phone in the back of it is a neat idea. And so if you have an office space where you want to listen to music, but you don't want to be distracted by your phone, it's kind of neat. You can kind of put your phone ringer on silent, put on your favorite playlist, and then put your phone in the back of this radio. And then I don't know whether it's engineered to help the sound, you know, resonate a little bit from an iPhone speaker right. or a cell phone speaker. That's what I was wondering, actually. Yeah. Just if it, would... it looks like it's just a holder. And they, they say strictly on the website that it's not a speaker, like it's not a powered speaker. It's not meant to make your phone louder. However, the aftermarket for Lego is huge. So I would imagine <laughs> that true. somebody will either hook it up to a real USB speaker or they will just design the inside of it to be a little bit more sonically shaped so that in the same way that if you put your iPhone in a, in a cup, you know, like a paper cup and you yeah. lay it down, it just becomes a speaker. Same idea. I feel like this is probably going to have a little bit of resonance, but the cool thing is like, if it doesn't sound good, then that'll make it sound like a 1970s transistor radio because they didn't <laughs> sound good either. Right. They can't lose. Yeah. So it's a neat idea. It's a really pretty object. I, I quite like it. Uh, it's a little steep, but uh, it's also really well designed. So it's, it's not something that's just thrown together as best they could. I feel like they've really gone out of their way to make it look as much like a transistor radio as they could. What is your pick this week? My pick this week is artist France Belleville Van Stone. She is a self-taught artist who does amazing crosshatch work. And it's often with just a ballpoint pen on paper. I've loved crosshatch work for years and years. And I used to do it when I was younger and just, I got pretty good at it, but I was never amazing at it. And I always felt like there was this sort of like kind of portion of learning that I just, I would have needed to kind of get past where I was onto something that was really cool. And, and I stumbled across a pro, uh, promo crosshatching course of hers years ago. And I really wanted to take it, but I didn't have any cash at the time. And then poof, like I couldn't, it's one of those things that I couldn't ever find it again. It was probably an ad on Instagram or right. something that was at the beginning or like it's part of that scroll never to be seen again. And, and I searched and searched and searched and I don't know what I changed in my search query in the past few months, but I found her again. I've bookmarked her, love her work, and I'm going to be taking one of her classes in the future for sure. That's awesome. I love it when you can find one of those old resources or even just find an online course that you can really connect with. I've taken a couple of online seminars and I've had a mixed bag of being really, really good and also mm. and a colossal waste of like, even if it was $5, when I feel burned, it doesn't matter how much it costs me. I just, yeah. I feel duped, but that's great. That sounds, that sounds really cool that you've been able to find them again. Yeah. I bookmarked all kinds of stuff. I've not yet had to go back to any of the recipes on TikTok and, and use them, but man, <laughs> I'm going to be glad when I need to find that one recipe for like a strawberry shortcake <laughs> tart something that I just want to make yeah. for somebody. And I'm just going to like, I know I have it somewhere and I know it's organized in a list under recipes. Like it's not that much to search through. I do bookmark anything. Cause I've had that same experience of like wanting to find that resource again. And it's like, I don't even remember what platform I saw it on, Yeah, you know, and if I can ever see it again, because the algorithm just changes like one minute, it thinks that I'm trying to get a get rich quick stream because like I watched five minutes of a video I shouldn't. And then the next minute it's just like, 
all the dog videos. That's fine. Like I like all the dog videos, but sometimes it's like, Hey, by the way, I like more than just dogs. Like, I feel like the <laughs> algorithm tends to double down. It's like, yeah. Oh, you watch three dog videos. We're going to give you all of them, all of them. And it's like, but I like other things too. <laughs> like what about Star know. Wars? You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's hard to try to find the right balance. Yeah. For me, it was like, I saw a cool uh, slam dunk in a clip for basketball. I was like, Oh, oh that's neat. <laughs> like it. Yeah. And now I'm the biggest basketball I'm the fan in the world now, apparently endless clips of like half court shots like okay that was fun the first time but like once i've seen yeah. one i've kind of seen them all yeah now you want the dogs back <laughs> well that wraps up this episode of the citadel cafe you can get more information about the show and links to some of the things that steven and i talked about at the citadelcafe.com music for the show was composed by kevin mcleod you can email the show at the citadel cafe at gmail.com just like lord valor find the show by name on social media we're very easy to find and subscribe for free on all of the major podcasting platforms and that includes youtube so just leave us a like leave us a follow subscribe wherever it's a great deal of help the rss feed and show notes are available on our website at the end of the day word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show it's free just tell friends about the show and let them know where they can listen to it. My name is Joel Duggan, and you can find links to all of the things that I am doing online, including all 300 episodes of The Spawn Chunks at thespawnchunks.com. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Thursday through Sunday when I am able to get a full streaming week in. And I do Lego streams on Fridays now. I'm building the Star Wars UCS TIE Interceptor, and I'm only not even a quarter of the way through. I think I've got quite a few bags left. So you still get time to check that out. Steven, where can people find you online? These days, mostly on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Steven ESE. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two. <laughs> <laughs>